Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we are going to be all over the place. And this is a rough week. There's some really good material here, and we're going to talk about it, but we're bouncing all over the place. We're kind of up in the mountain. We're down, then we're back in the mountain. Where are we? Moses is receiving tablets and breaking them and then getting more tablets. And hang on, there's a lot of good material here. But let's do a quick review of what we've been asked to study. We're skipping from 21 through 23, and then the first chapter we've been asked to study is 24 which is the children of Israel accepting the law. Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and the other portions of the law, and the children of Israel accept it. We accept this law, and he sprinkles blood on them as a sign of that acceptance. It's that sign of the receiving of the covenant. And then Moses is trying to get more and more people into the presence of God. And he succeeds this time. He brings Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 elders of Israel. And those 70 see God and have a marvelous experience with him. So Moses is pulling more and more people into the presence of the Lord. And the Lord says, look, I'm going to give you some stone tables. I'm going to give you a law. I'm going to give you some commandments. So Moses now prepares for a very long journey up with the Lord in Mount Sinai. He's going to be gone for 40 days. So at the very last verse of chapter 24, it says that Moses was in the mount for 40 days and 40 nights. Now that 40 days will span all the way into chapter 32. And that's chapter 24. Yeah, and then we skip a bunch of stuff, and then we get to the 31st chapter of Exodus, and that's where individuals are chosen. These individuals are skilled, and they are given the command to construct the furnishings of the tabernacle. And how are a bunch of slaves getting a bunch of gold in the middle of the the desert to make all this stuff out of gold? They borrowed the gold from the Egyptians, and so they take all their earrings and jewelry, and they put it together, and they melt it, and they make the stuff, the furnishings of the tabernacle. And we're going to talk about the tabernacle in this podcast. We're going to talk about some of those things, but that's the 31st chapter. And then the 32nd chapter has this really interesting thing happening. You see, Moses is having this conversation with God on the top of the mount, but down at the foot of the mountain, the Israelites are being naughty. And they say, we want a God. We want to remember or have this this uh, representative of God that brought us out. And there's this interesting phrase in the 32nd chapter where they make this golden calf and the statement is made, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And we're going to get into the weeds in the podcast on this and talk about what's going on with this golden calf and this rebellion. And God gets mad and Moses gets mad. And that kind of ends with this violent episode at the end of the 32nd chapter. Which gets us into chapter 33. At this point, the tabernacle is outside the camp. And Moses goes into the tabernacle and begins the operation of the tabernacle. And the Lord's presence come, and the shadow, and the fire, and clearly the Lord is with Moses in the tabernacle. And the people kind of get to see that the Lord's there, but they don't yet get to see the Lord in the tabernacle. They've been naughty, and they're in time out. But they can clearly see that the Lord is within their reach if they would repent and do what's right. And then the final chapter for this week's Come Follow Me is Exodus 34, and that's where Moses is instructed to make two new tablets. You see, in his wrath in the first episode with the golden calf, there's this destruction of the tablets, and so we have these two new ones made. And there's an interesting Joseph Smith translation that we're going to talk about from the very first verse of Exodus 34, but the general picture is that we're making two new tablets, and then the conclusion of the 34th chapter talks about the radiant countenance of Moses and how his face shone. And that's kind of the concluding chapter of this week's Come Follow Me, the 24th chapter, and then 31 through 34. But there's a lot of stuff in between. And so 
I want to talk about briefly some of the stuff we're skipping. We stopped last week after the Ten Commandments, and now we're picking it up because the Lord didn't stop after the Ten Commandments. He gave a little bit more. Yeah. And so, in fact, we're ratifying the covenant in the 24th chapter with the meal, a covenant meal with God. But 21, 22, and 23 are additions to the commandments. And in scholarship, this is called the covenant code. And I geek out a ton about this and some things. I wrote a paper on the divergent slave laws in the Old Testament. And so for those of you that are geek out fans, I'll link this in the show notes and you can read my short paper on the differences in the slave laws and these things. In fact, the very first thing out of the gate in the 21st chapter it talks about the slave laws. And there's quite a few verses dedicated to, okay, what do we do in these instances? And this isn't the only place that slave law is discussed in the Pentateuch. And I'm just going to come right out and say it. I'm not a fan of slavery. I don't personally believe that God is a fan of slavery either. I think it's not right that one man should be in bondage to another. That comes right out of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is very clear. It is not right that one man should be in bondage to another. So so what do we do with this? Uh, David Wright wrote a great book, and basically his book discusses how the covenant code used some of the existing laws in the ancient Near East. He's going to attach it to the laws of Hammurabi, which is 18th century B.C. This book's not for everybody. Uh, Clearly, his approach is from a scholarly position, but his approach to the covenant code, these chapters, is that it's a repackaging of uh, ancient Near Eastern law, and he makes a pretty strong case. So, we, I've talked about this before, this golden clay principle. So the scriptures, like there's a lot of gold in there, but there's also clay because people are involved in the construction of them. And so on on a continuum, if, if I'm holding out my right hand where everything there, and there's those that believe this with the Bible, that everything is pure revelation, it's perfect in every way. And then on the left hand, if my left hand is extended, there's individuals that think, okay, everything in the Bible is completely man-made. It's a complete construction made by man. There's no divinity in it. And along this continuum, I don't take either position on these chapters, um, but I'm not in the middle. When it comes to these chapters, I'm more towards my left hand, but it doesn't mean I'm right. And everybody takes a different position. But think about this. Remember Joseph Smith, where he said, um, everyone was disagreeing about the Bible. And he said, it was impossible for a man as young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to decide from the Bible who was right and who was wrong. And if you think about it, fundamental things that people struggled with in the 19th century in America, slavery, like You couldn't settle it from the Bible. People use the Bible to defend and attack slavery. Welcome to the Bible. Obviously, I'm not a fan of slavery, but there's those kinds of things in what's called the covenant code. Other things too, like what happens if Bryce's livestock does damage to my livestock? What if Bryce takes my chicken? What if his goat comes over and eats a bunch of my corn? Or what happens if uh, Bryce is guilty of sorcery, or if Bryce is an apostate, I got to do stuff to him. And then there's a bunch of stuff in here about the concern for the poor and the widows, all kinds of stuff. And so what we did was we outlined it in the show notes. You can go and read it, but I just wanted to at least pay homage to these texts and note that they were relevant to the people that lived in Israel at the time. They were relevant to these individuals because they had these kinds of questions. I don't think you and I are really worried about stealing someone's water or boiling a kid in its mother's milk. But in those times, they did have those kinds of questions. And so after the Lord goes through all these things, when it comes to how to behave, we get to what I'm going to say is the meat of this stuff, and that's going to be the 24th chapter. This is where they're going to agree to the covenant, and they're going to ratify it, and there's going to be a visionary experience. And this this is really cool. And so this is kind of the first chapter in Exodus that we're going to cover in Come Follow Me. Right. Do you accept or will you reject these? Will you live by this law? And the people come together, and in verse 3 it says, The people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord hath said, we will do. So there's an acceptance of the covenant. Now we're going to seal that. We're going to ratify that covenant. And so Moses prepares a sacrifice, and he takes the blood, and half of the blood he uses for the sacrifice. The other half, verse 7, he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said again, all that the Lord hath said we will do, and we will be obedient. And then Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. 
and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning all these words. Now, that is significant. It points to so many different things. The blood of a covenant should clearly point to Jesus made all of these covenants ratifiable and verifiable with the shedding of his blood. So clearly there's a reference to the Savior here. There's also, like the Nephites will do under Captain Moroni, do you remember when he rips his shirt and he says, this is what the Lord's going to do to us if we don't keep our covenants? And so there's this spirit of, we're going to shed our blood if we don't keep the covenants. It's kind of that acceptance. We are giving ourselves to this covenant. We receive it and may our blood be shed if we don't keep the covenant. To kind of illustrate that point, let me just read one verse from the Book of Mormon. When Zarahemna comes down against Captain Moroni and they kind of face off, Captain Moroni says the following to Zarahemna. This is Alma chapter 44, verse 4. It's easy to remember, 444. And he says, Now ye see that this is the true faith of God. Yea, ye see that God will support and keep and preserve us as long as we are faithful unto him and unto our faith and our religion. And never will the Lord suffer that we should be destroyed, except we should fall into transgression and deny our faith. So there's that idea that as long as we keep our covenants with God, we will be kept and supported and preserved. But if we don't keep our covenants, that's on us. The blood is on us. It's our fault if we are destroyed because we broke the covenant. So I think there's a lot going on here when the blood is sprinkled on them. Yeah, and I think the altar, the pillars— There's a lot going on here in this covenant setting. They're at the mountain. If you look in verse 4, it says that he built an altar, and then it says under the hill. But literally in the Hebrew, it's under the mountain. I'm just going to call it the mountain because I think hill just kind of takes away the, the significance of what we're doing. And then he's building these 12 pillars. And the book of the covenants related to this and everything that the Lord has said we will do. So all the stuff in 20, 21, 22, 23, all those stipulations of the covenant code, the people are agreeing to, and then they see God. Verse 10 says that they saw the God of Israel and under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone or lapis lazuli. It's this bright blue brilliance. And I see this as God standing above the waters again. He's above this surface of blue. There's a really cool picture that the church has that we put in the in the slides where they ratify this covenant and it's a bunch of people that see God. And Bryce, I find it really interesting that there's this conflict with whether or not you can see God. In Exodus, there's verses that say you can and there's verses that say you can't. There is a Joseph Smith translation change that addresses that that we're going to see in chapter 33. So maybe we read that now. Yeah, because, you know, if you look in Exodus thirty three twenty, it says, there shall no man see me and live. And then the JST says, thou canst not see my face at this time. At this time. He emphasizes at this time because you're not worthy. Doesn't yeah. mean you can't become worthy. It just means right now you can't see my face because you are exceedingly sinful. Yeah, ne- neither shall there be any sinful man that can see me at any time that shall see my face and live. We put some other ones in the show notes. So for example, John 1, verse 18, and then I give the Greek because I'm a weirdo, but I I translated it, which is, no one has seen God at any time ever. Pulpite could be at any time or ever. And the rest of the verse reads as follows. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us. But the Joseph Smith translation of John 1.18 reads as follows. No man has seen God at any time except he has borne record of the Son. For except it be through him, no man can be saved. So this means that whenever anyone has had contact with the Father, the Father has borne record to him of the Son. And this is congruent with the event in Matthew 3.17, after the baptism of Jesus, or Matthew 17.5 on the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Father bears witness of the Son, and also in 3 Nephi 11.7, when the resurrected Lord appears to the Nephites. In each of these examples, the Father testified of the Son. 
So we give some others, but I just want to just bear my witness of this idea that if we're looking for complete uniformity in the biblical text on some of these basic doctrines, the nature of God, whether you can see God, is it okay to own slaves? You're not going to get congruence in the biblical text because different authorship, and they have different theological perspectives. But the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to me, makes it clear individuals have seen him, and he will make himself known. And I think if we can understand that, and if we can read some of these chapters, because some of this stuff is going to be messy, but if we read it through the lens of the restoration, it will be clearer. And so I just want to testify to that. Now, speaking of the restoration, look at what happens next. I love that this is in the Bible because this has so much to do with the restoration and our world. So Moses comes down with a basic law, some very preliminary thou shalts and thou shalt nots and some codes. And he says, will you accept this? And they do. So what is the result of them accepting that basic covenant? The Lord says, come back up into the mountain, Moses, and I will give you more. As we are willing to receive his law, he gives us more. If we reject his law, he doesn't. That's the basic law of the church. There is so much to that simple reality that grace for grace and line upon line And we achieve that by receiving what he gives us. He gives you a little bit, you receive it, you get a little bit better, he gives you a little bit more. You receive that, you get a little bit more. Nephi will say it this way in the Book of Mormon. I'm going to read from 2 Nephi chapter 28, verse 30. He simply summarizes this whole thing with, And thus saith the Lord God, I will give unto the children of men line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. And blessed are those who hearken unto my precepts and lend an ear unto my counsel, for they shall learn wisdom. For unto him that receiveth will I give more. I'm going to say that one more time because that's that's going to be critical this week as you study these chapters. Unto him that receiveth will I give more, and from them that say we have enough, from them shall be taken away even that which they have. So quick summary of what you're going to read this week is when they accept the basic law of 20 through 23, when they say we will keep it, Moses goes up and receives a whole lot more. He receives the temple endowment. And then he comes down, and they've made a golden calf, and they, in essence, reject it. So then they get a lesser law. By the way, Bryce, I see that right here in the 24th chapter in verse 9, 10, and 11. To me, this is my reading of this. I superimpose this with the stuff we give you in the show notes on the book of Revelation with the marriage supper of the Lamb. I superimpose this with section 27 of the Doctrine and Covenants. And we talked about this with the Doctrine and Covenants year. But in section 27, the Lord says, you will sit down with me. And then he gives a laundry list of like who's who of some of the prophetic figures in history. And we are going to have a feast. And that feast, remember, that's in the first temple. We've taken that out today. We practice the feast weekly in the church. It's a symbolic feast. It's a small piece of bread and water. But it's this looking forward. It's a type to a future event where we will sit down with the Savior and feast. And like Bryce says, we will receive those things. In fact, that idea of feasting and things, the devarim is the things, but things, devarim, can mean things or words. And so what does Nephi say? Feast upon the words of Christ, or that could be devarim, could be things of Christ. And so literally, feasting is connected to the things and the words, And that's what we do in the temple. We receive the things of God in the temple. So here it is as a type or a symbol or a figure, the top of the mount. That's the temple. They're seeing God. That's the temple. And we're going to see this later in the podcast where we're going to talk about section 84 as a way to interpret these passages that God wants to give us all of this. And so this is just a mini drop of milk and honey in the midst of a bunch of messiness because we're going to leave 24 and it's going to get sketchy. Is that fair to say? Because That's... when he comes down with that more, they don't want they it. Don't want it. Yeah. They don't want the more. And so then he comes back with less. Chapter 24 is so critical that they accept the covenant, they see God, 
And then the Lord says, come back and get more. I'm going to give you some stone tables. I'm going to give you a law. I'm going to give you the temple. I'm going to give you the endowment. I'm going to give you so much more. So that's how it works. Receive what he's given you and he'll give you more. And that's what 24 is. They receive They see, and then the Lord says, come back to the mountain, Moses. Come back up. I've got more to give you. And so then the thunders are rumbling. The Lord is clearly preparing, and then Moses goes up. And he's going to be gone a long time to show you how much the Lord wants to give us. And that kind of brings us to the end of chapter 24. But then we skip another chunk. We skip from 25 through 30 because they are a hard read. But they are wonderful in knowing that they're building a tabernacle. They're building a temple. Yeah. And we're taking the pieces of that temple and putting it in place. And it's a marvelous opportunity to stop and sit down with your children and say, what's the symbolism of that piece of the temple? Yeah. If you were teaching little children, you could show pictures or even a short video. We'll link a great video in the show notes section And it's from a a great author. The name of his channel on YouTube is called Messages of Christ. He is a Latter-day Saint. Uh, One year he came out to the seminar where I was teaching, and he actually made the robes of the high priest and the ephod. He made this stuff. And I always, every time when I talk about the tabernacle, I show this video. It's about seven minutes. And I think that seven minutes captures the essence of Exodus 25 through 31. It really does. I love that Elder Bednar has been talking so much about the temple recently. He said the following in April of 2019, Indeed, temple preparation is most effective in our homes, but many church members are unsure about what appropriately can and cannot be said regarding the temple experience outside of the temple. President Ezra Taft Benson described why this uncertainty exists. So this is Elder Bednar quoting a prophet. President Benson said, The temple is a sacred place, and the ordinances of the temple are of a sacred character. Because of its sacredness, we are sometimes reluctant to say anything about the temple to our children and grandchildren. As a consequence, many do not develop a real desire to go to the temple. And when they go there, they do so without much background to prepare them for the obligations and the covenants they enter into. I believe, this is still President Benson, I believe a proper understanding or background will immeasurably help prepare our youth for the temple and will foster within them a desire to seek their priesthood blessings just as Abraham sought his. In other words, we can talk about the temple. We should talk about the temple. It is as wrong to not talk appropriately about the temple as it is to talk inappropriately about the temple. So Elder Bednar gives two guidelines. Guideline number one, because we love the Lord, we always should speak about his holy house with reverence. We should not disclose or describe the special symbols associated with the covenants we receive in sacred temple ceremonies. Neither should we discuss the holy information that we specifically promise in the temple not to reveal. So guideline number one is don't talk about the symbols associated with the covenants. And then guideline number two, the temple is the house of the Lord. Everything in the temple points us to our Savior, Jesus Christ. We may discuss the basic purposes of and the doctrine and principles associated with temple ordinances and covenants. We may discuss the purpose and the doctrine and the principles. And so what Mike and I would encourage you to do is to look for opportunities where you can show your children symbols of the temple that were in the tabernacle and how they point to Christ. So Mike and I are just really quickly going to walk you through the tabernacle of the Old Testament and how it points us to Christ and our journey from telestial to terrestrial to celestial. There are three portions of the temple. There was an outer courtyard, which represents the telestial kingdom. And coming out of the telestial and into the inner temple, the holy place, there was an altar of sacrifice and a bowl of water where you washed called a laver. 
So do you see that beautiful symbol? We come out of the telestial and into the terrestrial through sacrifice and washing. That points us to baptism and burying the natural man and coming out of the water of baptism committed to be clean and at least live a terrestrial life. So similar symbols in the church today. And then we come into the holy place. On the right-hand side is the table of shoe bread or the bread of the presence. On the left is the menorah, and it's literally shaped like a tree. It's like an almond tree, and there's all this stuff in there about knops and flowers and branches, and it is a tree. It's a sacred tree. And then right before the veil is the altar of incense. And John in the book of Revelation says that the, the smoke or the incense that goes forth to heaven is the prayer of the saints. And so if we think about this from a Latter-day Saint perspective, and we think about where are we in the temple right before the veil, and how that is involved with prayer and unlocking the powers of heaven and invoking God to come into his presence, then we go into the holy place. Which represents the presence of God. We go through the veil and embrace God's presence. And in that holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat, and God's presence was in there. And what I love is that inside that ark was the tablets of stone, a pot of manna, and Aaron's rod. So think about the symbolism, what leads us into the Father's presence. It's the laws of God, manna. It's the rod of God, the prophet, and it's the bread of God so many wonderful things that kind of describe that journey from telestial to terrestrial to celestial. And it's dredged in images of Christ. I mean, from the very beginning of the altar, we have the lamb, and then we have the bread of the presence and inside the holy place with Jesus is the bread of life. He's the light of the world. And then the ark, this box that's gold, is often referred to as a couple of things. One is the mercy seat, and the other one is his footstool. Now, it's not an exodus, but John's going to put it in there, so I feel like I can say this. In the book of Revelation, John says there's a throne in there, there's a tree in there, and there's a river coming out. Ezekiel does the same stuff. And the reason why is because we're talking about God's throne. And so on one of the slides, we actually show how going through the steps in the temple is reversing the effects of the fall. By going through the steps, we're coming back to the throne of God. Now, I believe in stories, and I believe a great way to remember a story is a physical reminder. And one day I was pondering every single one of these physical manifestations of the tabernacle, and it was like a light bulb went off in my head, so now I'm going to share that light bulb with you. Every one of these things is the story of the Exodus. Chapter 12, they sacrifice a lamb. That's the bronze altar. Then they cross the sea. They're going through the waters of chaos. In fact, it's actually called Yam in the text in Hebrew, which is the sea, the molten sea. Then they come into the holy place, and what do they have? They have the bread of the presence, and they have light. They're guided by a pillar of light. Oh, but there's also a pillar of smoke. That's the altar of incense. And then when they get to the top of the mount, they see God. So every single one of these accruements of temple worship is literally the story of the Exodus. Like, it's so cool. Which is a symbol of our mortal journey. So help your children see the symbolism of these temples. And it's not just the physical things. You can take a look at Aaron and his sons. And Aaron was the high priest. And the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And he carried 12 stones on his breastplate. And you could have a wonderful discussion with your children about Jesus carries us into the presence of the Father. But there was a real limitation as to who actually went into the Holy of Holies. The high priest did, but not everyone else did. At least in the text we have. And then there's this beautiful moment at the crucifixion of Christ. As soon as Jesus says, it is finished and gave up the ghost, two things rip the earth rips, there's an earthquake, and the veil of the temple rips, symbolically suggesting 
that now anyone can go into the presence of the Father because of the atonement that Christ just performed. Everyone can go into the presence of the Father. The veil is no longer an obstacle, and now everyone can come in. And the earth rips as a sign that death is no longer an obstacle. And so beautiful images, as you walk through these chapters, you may want to pick a couple images that have some meaning to you and teach your children about symbols of the temple and of Jesus. Last thought for me, there's so much, we could do a whole podcast on this, but the last thought for me here is that the Holy of Holies uh, was also called the Oracle, and that word is Debir, and that's where the word came out. Devar, the word came from the place of speaking. There's a lot connected here. When Lehi's at the tree, he calls out with a loud voice. And who does he call to? He calls to his family. And so I read First Nephi 8 as the journey to the temple and the tree with the fruit that's most sweet and most white to me is at the Holy of Holies. And Lehi then would be Heavenly Father calling out to his family with a loud voice from the place of speaking, come and partake of the fruit of the tree. Nephi knows these symbols inside and out. And so the most sweet and most white, we've talked about it before, that is going to be the land of milk and honey. The land of milk and honey, the land of Canaan, is a type for the Holy of Holies. So they must leave Mitzrayim, Egypt. Well, Mitzrayim is a word that's fascinating. See, the mem preposition means from, and the em ending means plural. So what's going on with that sar? That sar means narrow, straight, or tight. So literally, Mitzrayim, Egypt in Hebrew, literally means the tight, straight places, or the place of tightness. Now, that's a perfect name because they were in slavery. But think about the story. They're in the land of Canaan. They're promised the land. But then they go down. They leave God's presence, and they go to Mitzrayim, the place of tightness or the straight way. To come to the land of milk and honey, they must go on the straight or narrow way. It's fascinating. I mean, even the name Egypt is teaching the plan. And I see Nephi uses both ways to read it. It's straight, S-T-R-A-I-G-H-T, and it's straight, S-T-R-A-I-T. It's both forms of the narrow way. The narrow way is the way to get back to God, to the land of milk and honey. And that Holy of Holies is a cube. It's 10 by 10 by 10. We think cubits in the Exodus account when they build the temple. When Solomon gets it built, it's a 20 by 20 by 20. And that cube is what John sees come down out of heaven. It's this image of perfection and this image of everything's put back. So to me, I think these chapters are important. That's why we spent a couple minutes talking about it. But After we leave this, after we construct all these things, then we get to the 31st chapter of Exodus, and this is where we pick it up again and come follow me. And we start with this wonderful concept that the Lord says, look, I've given you some hard tasks. You're you're required to make some very complicated objects and to lay them with gold and to create some beautiful artistry. But guess what? I've provided you the means to do so. There were two men and others among the Israelites, Bezalel and Aholiab, who had the talents to do the very things that the Lord had prescribed. They knew how to work gold. They knew how to carve wood. They knew how to make this temple as beautiful as it should be. And so the Lord says, I have provided these two. There, it's not a coincidence that two very talented men came to earth at that particular moment, and the Lord placed them in a position to use their talents to do the very things that he wanted done. And I love that lesson. I love the fact that the Lord always provides the solution to his request. It goes back to what Nephi said to Lehi, that the Lord never gives a commandment without preparing the way to obtain it. And that maybe we ought to consider that your talent was specifically sent to the church today, that whatever talent he gave you, 
whatever talent you possess, your coming forth into the kingdom today is his divine doing, because he knew that in order to accomplish the church's task that we have today, he needed your skill set. And so he sent your skill set, your ability, you to earth today so that you would be there when the Lord needed you. I think there's something to that that we all need to ponder. Why am I here at this time in the earth's history? Well, are you the modern-day Bezalel or a Holiab? Are you the one that the Lord has positioned to do exactly what he needs done? The Lord always provides the solution to the challenges that we face. Kind of an interesting twist on that. There's a fascinating verse at the end of Alma chapter 46 that just really speaks volumes to me. As we prepare for the war with Amalekiah and the Lamanites, it says in verse 40, there were some who died with fevers, which at some seasons of the year were very frequent in the land, but not so much with fevers because of the excellent qualities of the many plants and roots which God had prepared to remove the cause of diseases to which men were subject by the nature of the climate. In other words, that climate had some problems. That climate brought some diseases. But the Lord placed in that climate plants and roots which would cure the very problems that that climate provided. That is a little microcosm example of what God does. Every time he gives us a task that's a challenge, he also provides us the solution if we'll just find it. It's there. We just need to find it. And you are here to help the Lord provide the answers that he's asking this church to provide. So I love the beginning of chapter 31, where the Lord says, hey, I've just given you some tough tasks, but I've also provided you some very talented people who will be able to do those tough tasks. Now, before we leave chapter 31, the Lord again emphasizes the Sabbath day. And I want you to pay attention this week how often the Lord mentions the Sabbath day. They are in the desert. Life is hard. They are working very hard to survive. They're gathering their bread. They have uh, limited resources. And the Lord reminds them that they need to rest. And I love verse 17. I can't walk away from chapter 31 without emphasizing verse 17, where the Lord says, look, the Sabbath is a sign. You observe the Sabbath as a sign. And then he reminds them in verse 17, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and I love these three words, and was refreshed. You need to make sure that in your journey through the wilderness, you find time to rest and be refreshed. I think we've got to pause and say that. We all need to rest and be refreshed. Now that leads us to chapter 32 and the golden calf. (laughs) Yeah, so the golden calf is an interesting story. And a lot of ink has been spilled on this because there's the story and then there's the story behind the story. And there's some really interesting things that you read in here where you ask yourself, okay, why does it say this? For example, verse four. First of all, they make a calf, singular. But then they say in verse four, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I mean, why does it say these be thy gods in the plural? And then we have it again at the end of verse eight. These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And that's God speaking to Moses in verse eight. He's saying, hey, you need to get down because the people have corrupted themselves. And this is what they're saying. So. If something's repeated twice and also it doesn't make sense, plural versus singular, my spidey sense starts tingling. I start saying, okay, why is this in here? Why does it read like this? I remember as a teenager reading this going, okay, first of all, the gods that brought them out of Egypt weren't bulls. They weren't calves. It was Jehovah. So I've got a question there. And so we're going to present some possibilities to you to consider. We're going to link some papers where if you want to do a deep dive into this and pull threads, there's a lot going on. But to be short in speaking, if we're just going to tell the story, 
they cast their golden earrings in verse 2 to Aaron. Why? Moses is up on the mountain for 40 days. And they're like, well, maybe he's gone. We don't know what's going on. So we want something to kind of give us our fix, give us our experience with the divine. And so he does. He he makes him a molten calf in verse 4. And when he made it, verse 5, he built an altar before it. And he made a proclamation and he said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So we're talking about these gods, plural. We're talking about a calf. And now we're talking about Jehovah. So mm, confusion. Verse six, they rose up early in the morrow and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. They sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Interesting choice of words. And the Lord said to Moses, go get down. Why? Verse seven, they've corrupted themselves and they've turned aside quickly out of the way. And then it's the Lord saying that in verse eight, these be thy gods. So after that, if you look in verses 10 through 14, there's this really interesting exchange between Moses and God. God says, listen, I'm going to destroy them. They're all bad. They've totally messed up. And in the 12th verse, Moses says, uh, Lord, if you do that, the Egyptians are going to make fun of you. They're going to say, you delivered these guys just so you could destroy them, and they're going to question your awesomeness. And so in verse 14, God says, you know what? You're right, Moses. I'm going to not destroy them. And so Moses comes down with the two tables, it says in the 15th verse, and he comes down off the mountain and he gets really mad. His anger waxes hot and he casts the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. And then I love verse 20. It reminds me of the story of the kid who gets caught smoking. Yeah, and the the dad's like, You're going to smoke the whole pack. I love I just I love reading this verse. He took the calf which they made and he burned it with fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made him drink it. I don't know why. I just love that. And essentially, he gets on them and says, you know, what are you guys doing? And then I love the excuse. I love the excuse, Aaron says, where he says, don't get mad at me, verse 22. You know these guys are always set on trouble. And they said to me, verse 23, make us gods, which shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know where he is, verse 24. And I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. And so they gave it to me. And then I cast it in the fire and out jumped the calf. (laughs) There it is. It's good stuff. Wasn't me. (laughs) Don't blame me. And then there's this really troubling section where Moses asks, well, who's on God's side? And the sons of Levi say, well, we are. And verse 28 happens. The children of Levi kill some of these rebels. And it's not just some, it's 3,000 of them. And it's a, like, it's a tough thing. Now, that's the story. There's morals, like what's the moral of the story? And then there's the other thread we, I want to pull on is scholarship. What do scholars do with this? How does this relate or help us understand what's happening historically? And so some of these things are worth exploration. I think in a gospel doctrine setting, we, you would kind of teach the story and then say, okay, guys, what's the moral? And I love this. I love uh, Brigham Young's use of this. When the saints came here to Utah, um, we're coming here and it's really hard. And we have a really hard time growing things at first and we're kind of hungry. And then in, in like 1849, some people find gold in California. And the temptation was a lot of members of the church were like, man, if I go to California, I'll be rich. And Brigham Young gives this talk in Farmington where he says, hey, you guys, we're going to do a lot better if we grow wheat here in Utah. But if you go to California, go ahead and go worship your golden calf. But if you stay here, we're going to build saints here. This is a good place for making saints. It's kind of used as a metaphor for walking away from the mountain, Yeah, walking away from Moses. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to geek out just briefly, but know that there's a lot more. So you can go and read more. But just if you look at that phrase, these be thy gods. That same phrase is repeated by a king in the book of Kings, and that king's name is Jeroboam. You see, when the kingdom of Israel splits in half, Jeroboam makes golden calves in Dan and Bethel. Because he's got a problem, okay? So the kingdom splits, he's in the north, and the temple's in the south. Now, Exodus 34 is going to tell us that every Israelite is supposed to go to the temple three times a year. So Jeroboam has a problem. He's worried that if the northern faithful go to the temple, they won't come back. 
So that's his problem. They're required three times a year to go to the temple in Jerusalem, which is in the other kingdom, and he's worried that they won't come back. And so Jeroboam builds beautiful altars on the way to the temple. So he says, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I'm actually quoting not only Exodus 32, but I'm also quoting 1 Kings 12, verse 28. And then in the 29th verse, it says, he set one in Bethel, and he also put another one in Dan. And so Jeroboam does this, and he's cast as an apostate king from the perspective of the writer of 1 Kings. This is the same statement that Aaron makes. Now, what's interesting is Aaron has two sons. The names of Aaron's sons and the names of Jeroboam's sons are almost identical. Aaron's are Nadab and Abihu, and the sons of Jeroboam are Nadab and Abijah, or Abiyah. It's literally off by one little yod. It's super close. And so the idea, I think, what the authors of Exodus 32 are trying to portray, and once again, This is, according to scholarship, this is a northern text. This is an e-text in Exodus 32, and they're casting negative light on Jeroboam and Aaron. And there's this tension in the Old Testament. The tension is, who are the authorized representatives of God? And the good guys in 32 are the Levites. The Levites are the ones that are following Moses. And so at the end, they're the ones that are killing some of these apostates. And that this chapter is casting Aaron in that light as an apostate. So because of that phraseology being used and the image of a calf or a bull, I think what we've established or what could be argued is that there's something going on here in Exodus 32 connected to the tension between the division of the north and the south. The northern king doesn't have the temple like Bryce talked about, so he builds altars with these calves to kind of substitute the temple that's in Jerusalem. And there is tension for 200 years between Judah and Israel over who are the authorized representatives. My take on this is that Exodus 32 is from a group of priests that follow the Moses tradition. And they are these Levitical priests. And if you go to 1 Kings 12, we'll talk about this more when we get there. But it says that Jeroboam takes out the priests and he puts bad ones in their place. So those disenfranchised priests, we think, are the ones who have this tradition of Exodus 32. Remember, the Elohist text comes from the north. So when the northern kingdom's destroyed, they bring their records down with them to Judah And this is where I talk about chocolate and peanut butter coming together, making Reese's peanut butter cups. We have J and E, the Elohis from the north, the Yahweh's from the south, put together. And we see some of these ideas in the text reflected in history. In other words, that Exodus 32 could represent a theological rift in the 10th and 9th centuries. Now, with that being said, let's briefly talk about the calf. First of all, why does it say, these be thy gods? And second of all, why is it used? So first, I think these be thy gods. I think we've, we've established, at least argued, that the calves in Dan and Bethel could represent those plural. As far as why the calf, there's lots of perspectives on this. One of them is that the bull or the calf is a representation of God the Father. It could be the masculine representation of his presence. Remember, in the 49th chapter, when Jacob gives the blessing to Joseph, he makes this statement, and I think it's worth looking at, and I think we've looked at it before, but I'm just going to briefly reference it. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, talking to Joseph, he says, his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And you'll notice in your scriptures that the word God is in italics. And the reason why is because in the Hebrew, that's not what it says. It literally says the mighty of Jacob, or to be literal, it's Abir Yaakov. Yaakov is Jacob. Abir is what is translated as mighty, but it's a cognate of the word bull. And it does mean bull. Literally, a beer can mean bull or it can mean mighty. Remember, the bull represents strength or might. And the bull was a symbol for God. It was also a symbol for the very first character in Hebrew, Aleph. In um, proto-Hebrew, before the Aleph, it was the sign of the bull. The bull was a symbol of God. Why? 
because the bull was fertile. The bull was strong and powerful and mighty, and it was a masculine symbol of God. And so Paul Hoskinson wrote this paper for BYU Studies where he talks about that the bull could be a symbol for a god, and another thing it could be a symbol for in the iconography of the ancient Near East is the pedestal of God or his seat. And so we put together an article on this, and there's actually pictures to demonstrate that there were many images in the ancient Near East of bulls or lions represented as pedestals of God. So I think a good way to read this is as follows. I think what Aaron's doing is he's making a pedestal for Jehovah. I think in the context of this, when he says, this is the God that brought us out of Egypt, I think he's making a pedestal to invoke God's presence. And I think there's a lot that's been edited and it's used for historical purposes as a polemic against certain individuals. Who? Jeroboam. I think that's one way to look at it. Remember, if you're from the North and you're these priests that have been disenfranchised, you don't like him. And so you're going to cast him as an apostate. That's one way to look at it. Certainly, this is not the only reading, but I think we can read this and say, where are you facing? I think that's the main thing, but just know there's other ways to read this. There's a lot of history here. Yeah. Moses's question really is appropriate. Who is on the Lord's side? That's the main thing. With this, he breaks the tablets. Now, let's pick up that story. I know we'll jump a little bit to 34. We'll get to the rest of 32 and 33 in a minute. But I want to tell that story because, again, we're back to that basic message that I hope you pull out of this week's Come Follow Me, is that when you receive, you receive more. If you reject what God has given you, you're going to get less. And so he breaks the tablets, and then if you'll go to the Joseph Smith translation of chapter 34, just right there in 1 and 2, this is what Joseph Smith adds. This is how Joseph processes this whole story. In verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two other tables of stone, like unto the first, and I will write upon them also. The words of the law, according as they were written at the first on the tables, which thou breakest, but it shall not be according to the first, for I will take away the priesthood out of their midst, therefore my holy order and the ordinances thereof shall not go before them. For my presence shall not go up in their midst, lest I destroy them. Which would suggest that the first set of tables had something similar to our endowment, the Melchizedek priesthood portion of the endowment, something like that, a higher, a holier order. But because they weren't willing to live that way, they don't get that. So the Lord says, I'm going to give them a law but it'll be a lesser law. Verse two of the JST, he continues, but I will give unto them a law as at first, but it shall be after the law of a carnal commandment. For I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my presence, into my rest in the days of their pilgrimage. So the point here is they were not willing to receive that higher law. After receiving the initial portion back in chapter 24, and covenanting to receive it, they are now not ready to receive the higher law. Their actions suggest that. And so the Lord says, okay, I will take away that higher law and give you a lower law. And there we see that basic premise of the gospel. If you reject what he's offered you, he will take it away and give you less. If you receive what he offers you, he will give you more. The Lord is always willing to meet you where you're at. What are you willing to receive? And that's what he'll give you. But anyone who wants more will get more. They could have had more had they been willing to receive it. Now, sometimes Latter-day Saints look at these Israelites and thumb the nose a little bit and say, Oh, we're so much better than they were. I can't believe they rejected the higher law and were content with a lower law. And yet, the Lord has indicated in our day that we're doing the same thing. Bryce, I see myself doing this all the time. All the time. I'm content with lesser when I could have more. Let me give you a couple of examples. 
I remind you that the Book of Mormon came as two pieces. There was a translatable piece that was not sealed, and then there was a sealed portion. And Joseph was was given both. Here they are, right in front of you, Joseph. And we are taught that the way to break that seal and open up the rest of that book is to receive this portion of the book. Let me give you an example. In 3 Nephi chapter 26, Mormon is tempted to include some of the Savior's teachings, which will end up in the sealed portion of the gold plates, and he was tempted to include them in his record, which was going to be translated by Joseph Smith. So he says in verse 8, These things have I written, which are a lesser part of the things which he taught the people, and I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again unto this people. Verse 9, when they shall receive this, meaning the portion of the Book of Mormon that was intended to be translated, when they shall receive this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith, and if it so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. If it so be that they will not believe these things, then shall the greater things be withheld from them. Verse 11, Behold, I was about to write them, all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. The Book of Mormon itself is an example of, do you want more or are you content with less? We have the lesser portion of the gold plates, and we were given that lesser portion as a test. If we dive into that lesser portion and are faithful to the test, it will unlock the door to the greater truths in the Book of Mormon. And yet, if you'll fast forward to Doctrine and Covenants section 84, starting in verse 54, he says, now, it's not coincidental that we're in 84, right, Mike? Yeah, I mean, this 84 is... has a lot to do with Moses and the Exodus and this portion of the mountain. We'll get to that. But later on in 84, the Lord says in verse 54, your minds in times past have been darkened because of unbelief and because you have treated lightly the things that you have received. Now, he's going to tell us what we've treated lightly. Which vanity and unbelief have brought the whole church under condemnation? And this condemnation rests upon the children of Zion, even all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon. And the former commandments, that's the Bible, which I have given them, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. Again, the Lord is saying, you're not passing the test. So forgive me if I'm a little in all of our faces on this issue, but before we sit here and condemn the Israelites for being content with a lower law, we need to realize that we're doing the same thing, that the Lord has given us lesser portions of many things, including personal revelation. And Bryce, I would even add, embedded in the text of the Book of Mormon are what Nephi is going to call the mysteries. And I really do believe that that's in there. Like the stuff that's coming next is hinted at in what we have. It's beautiful, and it's drenched in temple theology. Which I think made Neil A. Maxwell say the following, Thus the Book of Mormon is like a vast mansion with gardens, towers, courtyards, and wings. There are rooms yet to be entered with flaming fireplaces waiting to warm us. Yet we as church members sometimes behave like hurried tourists, scarcely venturing beyond the entry hall. I don't want to be too accusatory, but how many of us have been content to stay in the entry hall of the Book of Mormon? And we have not gotten into the inner rooms we haven't discovered the courtyards and the towers and the gardens that is sitting in a book that most of us hold in our pockets. Or sometimes, Bryce, I'm just like the people in Exodus 32, where I say, 
why is this taking so long? And I kind of lose patience. And I really see this story also in Nephi's narrative. And sometimes I feel like I'm doing stuff like Nephi, and sometimes I see myself as layman. And I think all of us from time to time wear different hats. And I think these stories have relevance because they remind us of our human nature and and that human tendency. And, you know, even though Exodus 32 is messy, I do love it. I think it's a great story. And I think it it's like a gem that you hold it up to the light. And every time you turn the gem, you see something different. And I think it's good. And I do like that image, by the way, of the bull representing the might of God. And when they build the temple in Solomon, they take the labor and it's this cup filled with water, which represents the divine feminine, the divine mother, water and life in the cup. And they put it on top of bulls. In other words, it's father and mother. And what do we do? We go into the water and come out new. And it involves both of those ideas. I think that's really kind of neat. So I like that image, but I also get that from our perspective, it's kind of clunky. It's kind of messy. Now, while we're still in section 84, that is a powerful section regarding Moses and the Exodus. It is. I mean, if you look at verse 33, if you're faithful to obtaining the priesthood, you receive these really interesting things. You're sanctified and renewed in verse 33. You become the sons of Moses and of Aaron and the seed of Abraham. And then if you receive him, you receive the priesthood, then you receive Christ, and then you receive the Father. And then in verse 38, it says, He that receiveth my Father receiveth my Father's kingdom. Therefore, all that my Father hath shall be given unto him. In other words, it's layers or it's a continuum. You keep receiving light and you get more light, which is kind of tied into verse 44 and 45. You live by every word that comes from God. You receive truth, which is light, and light is the spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so you grow in degrees. And by the way, I'm looking at this image of the tabernacle, and that's what it is. It's the hero's journey. It's a journey where you receive more light. You proceed from the altar to the labor, to the holy place, to the embrace with God, to his presence, the land of milk and honey. So I love it. It's really cool. It's everything you're talking about, Bryce, where you keep receiving more. So now we're going to go back to Exodus 32, where Moses offers this prayer. Now, Moses becomes a great symbol of Christ in these chapters. On several occasions in this week's Come Follow Me, you're going to read about Moses pleading for his people. And I love to see the tenderheartedness of Moses. If we'll go back to chapter 32, he says to the people, this is Moses to the people in verse 30, ye have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord, peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sins. I'm going to go plead for you. And then verse 33, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, now, this is Moses pleading for his people before the Father, but you have to read Jesus pleading your case to God. Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. And then whatever we've done, in their case, they have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. I think you should take a few minutes this week and ponder those words and think about how Jesus feels about you. I can't believe Moses loved them to that degree, because as I read Exodus 32, man, they were a stubborn, stiff-necked people, but he loved them. And for him to say, please forgive them, and if you won't forgive them, blot me, I pray, out of thy book. I want you to hear Jesus saying similar words to the Father. If you'll turn to section 45 of the Doctrine and Covenants, this is our advocate pleading for us. I have this image of a court scene going on in the eternities where Satan is trying to convince God that there's no way I should be saved because of all the horrible things that I've done. And then my advocate stands up. Now, he's not going to counter the argument by, well, Bryce did all these good things, so you should save him. That's not the argument. 
the argument is not that I should be saved because of good things I've done. Listen to the argument. Jesus says in section 45, verses 3 through 5, listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest that thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. In other words, don't save them because they deserve to be saved. Save them because I deserve to be saved and I love them. And I don't want to be in thy kingdom without them. That's our advocate. That's Jesus pleading our cause to the Father. So as you take a few minutes this week and ponder those verses in chapter 32 and hear Moses' love saying, if you can't forgive them, then blot me out and save them. And just hear Jesus saying the same thing to the Father. That's beautiful. I really like that image of Moses as a figure for the Savior Jesus Christ. I think that's beautiful. So with that, we're going to close this podcast, and we'll see you next week when we cover the end of Exodus and some parts of Leviticus. And we hope that you have a great week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions.